Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ross King, and I serve as head of the Department of Asian Studies. I'm going to welcome all of you to this evening's watch lecture. Um, before I do anything else, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Muscogee people. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work that our department offices, students and staff, uh, Foremost amongst the staff, Oliver Mann, who always puts together a really good event for us. I want to thank them for all of their hard work. And before I turn the mic over uh, to Leo Shin, I also want to um, thank the Watt brothers, uh, Alex and Chi Shum, who have made uh, this event and indeed our new and flourishing Cantonese language program possible through years of quite extraordinary generosity. Could you please join me in giving them a And the final acknowledgement that I would like to make uh, is to my uh, dear colleague Leo Shin, who will be up here in just a moment, uh, but I'm going to embarrass him for a few minutes. Well, not just maybe a minute or two. Uh, if you, well, first of all, uh, Professor Shin uh, is the driving force behind our Hong Kong Studies Initiative, uh, which has now been going for a few years and which has generated new courses about Hong Kong, Cantonese borders, etc., uh, is yes, helped organize today's lecture. And um, to hear more about that project and about his research, I encourage you to visit either uh, the uh, UBC homepage, the front page of the UBC website, happens to be carrying a very nice interview, video interview with uh, Leo uh, as we speak, and then also the Faculty of Arts has a very nice, uh, has the same thing. So I encourage you to go home and, and, and watch that tonight. It's, it's just four minutes or so. Um, but I'm going to let now uh, Leo Shin uh, come up and uh, introduce our very distinguished guest speaker. So please welcome Leo to the Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross. Uh, I usually have just a very brief introduction because I like to get to know you. Um, I'm very mindful that events like this is not about the organizer, it's really about the speaker. But I did type up something which is a very other characteristic, um, other character to, um, because there are a few things I do want to share with you. Uh, first of all, I want to really thank uh, Alex and Chi Sung Wok for, um, for Sponsoring this um, sort of very important series of, of lectures at this day. I uh, want to note that uh, Alex tonight cannot join us, um, but I trust that our audience will join me in sending our best wishes to Alex and to send our collective power team uh, to, to Alex for his uh, speedy recovery. I also want to thank my colleagues and uh, the staff members of the department for their help in facilitating today's event, uh, but also for Professor Sewell's visit in general. Um, tomorrow morning, Professor Sewell will visit our, uh, one of our new courses on the history of Cantonese world to give a guest lecture to the students. And tomorrow evening, we're, we're, we're making full use of our visit. And tomorrow evening, she'll be giving a, uh, a community conversation in the Wish the Park Bible. And the talk is going to be Cantonese, uh, and it's going to be uh, about Hong Kong. So, uh, so that's, that's what I'm uh, I think I also want to thank the staff, um, uh, all of the men, because uh, I don't know what we can do without him. Um, and also for all the uh, student assistants, volunteers, undergraduate, graduates, for helping us uh, put these all together. But last but not least, I want to uh, take a moment to mark um, the passing of Mr. Yin Zhe, um, uh, who passed away in March this year. As um, many of you know, uh, Mr. Zhe was, until his retirement in 1999, he was the ever helpful, resourceful, and knowledgeable librarian, a Chinese librarian at our Asian Library. And uh, I don't know Mr. J as well as some of you do. Um, I just want to share very briefly. I remember some years ago when I had the opportunity to organize um, one of the work lectures. I noticed that um, we didn't have a banner or we didn't have a serviceable banner. 
So the first person that I thought of was Mr. J, because Mr. J was, among other things, a master calligrapher. So I gave him a call, call. he probably don't, didn't know who I was. I gave him a call, and the end result is what he said. So that's the kind of thing that Mr. J did. I also want to take note of Mr. J's passing for another reason. Again, when uh, the idea of starting a Hong Kong study started at BBC, we call it an initiative um, because we don't know how far it's going to go. And to call it anything grander, set yourself up to, 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 to problems. Um, so we like to think of this as this is the, the, the beginning of the third season of the Hong Kong Studies Initiative. And we'll see how far that will go. But when, I, when we first, first thought uh, starting the initiative at UBC, uh, Mr. J was one of the first people I called. Again, because I think having a good deal card is very important. Having a good band name is very important. Having a good name is very important. So again, I asked him, and again, without hesitation, uh, there is the band. That's the name. But I'm also, I also want to know, not just say he was providing all these free labor books, uh, but I also called him because I thought that um, Mr. Dick being from Hong Kong, um, and I had a sense that he cared about Hong Kong. And so when I called him, part of my agenda, secret agenda, is to float the idea to him. This is a good idea. But I didn't really ask him. But I asked him to write it, tell him to us. And he was very enthusiastic, and he was uh, very encouraging. And so that actually gave us the, 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 the momentum or the encouragement to, to go on with uh, this. So, since we're talking about uh, the Hong Kong Studies Initiative, I do want to take a moment to do some promotion. So we have a video today, and um, this is the world premiere video. This is the first world premiere of a video um, about the Hong Kong Studies Initiative. It's going to take five minutes, sorry to take up five minutes of this is a, uh, Professor Silk's time, but I think you might be interested. Hong Kong is a metropolitan city, a very important city. It actually plays a very important role in the modernization of China. And Vancouver has a close connection with Hong Kong. So I think to understand Asia, Hong Kong will be a good place to begin with. Hong Kong has always been a place that's been connected to other places by the Cantonese-speaking migrants who went through Hong Kong, who did business in other parts of the world, who set up you know, companies that were in multiple locations. The story of the resilience of people, the, what, the sort of miracles that we put together, the intensity of life that you experience in Hong Kong, and then all the uncertainties going through political struggle, um, it means a lot and is uh, a laboratory for, you know, for a lot of other issues in Asia. So why study Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong is a great story. It's a story, of course, of colonialism, but it's also a story of capitalism and nationalism. But above all, it is an extraordinary story of the flows of goods, ideas, and people. And it is a spectacular story of the construction and fusion of identities. I hope people understand Cantonese is not just a dialect, as many people would say. And it has its own culture, it has its own history, and it's also constantly evolving and changing by the minute. Film industry is one way of, uh, of showing that you, know, you can get this wonderful mixture of both commercial film and art film and come up with some great, great cinema. 
actually Hong Kong literature is very rich and diverse. It is not only written in Chinese, but also in English. There's still much we need to learn about Hong Kong's past. Take the 1967 riots, for example. Even though it's a very important event in Hong Kong's history, there's still much we need to learn. So doing this course will not only help you know something about Hong Kong in China and Macau, but also know about your communities and we get to the bottom of why there's so many good things some places in Vancouver, for example. That I'm not just showing people in the classroom that history, but they get to actually be in the village, they actually get to explore Hong Kong and learn about it. So when we talk about Hong Kong, it is all related. You know, I think um, if we uh, put it into perspective, this is a real Hong Kong studies. It would be a way to recognize the enormous contributions of Hong Kong people to this university and to the whole Vancouver region. And since it would cover so many different areas, it would also appeal to, I think, to a very wide range of students. My name is Leo Shin, and I'm the convener of the UBC Hong Kong Studies Initiative. The goal of our initiative is a fairly simple one. It is to facilitate the teaching and research of this most improbable metropolis, both as an extraordinary Chinese city and as a spectacular international and transnational hub. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to visit our website or follow us on social media. There, you will learn about the variety of Hong Kong related courses we offer at UBC, the range of research projects my colleagues and I are engaged in, and the wide array of academic and community events we are organizing. We hope you are as excited about the Hong Kong Studies Initiative as we are, and we look forward to your joining us on this venture. Which is 
the interconnectedness of Asia. So the first volume is about uh, movements of connections. And the second volume is about connected places. So moments in time, and then places of connections. And then the third volume, um, I think I was informed, is about people. And if there are too many books to read of Professor Skill, then I would recommend this one. Um, it's a collection of her publications, of her essays, and it was published two years ago. Uh, it's called Tracing China, a 40-year ethnographic journey. So there you would find a very thoughtful introduction to, or, or introduction to Professor Skill's scholarship, and also how the sort of wide reading subject that she's interested in. So uh, that would be the title if you want to just pick one of them, uh, Tracing China. <laughs> of all these books and publications, I mean, I, there are many ways to characterize the Versus Seals scholarship, and I'll just point to briefly three. That stands up to me as a particularly good First is the historical sensibility, as I said. Versus uh, Seals is really as much a historian as an anthropologist. Um, and the second one, well, and, and this comes out very clearly in the chapter title of the introduction of her, of her collection of essays. Uh, she titled the introduction as China as a process. So immediately you think of processes, changes, um, time is obviously a very important element in this process. The second characteristic or feature of Professor Seuss writing um, is the emphasis of, from the ground up, right? looking at it from the bottom up rather than from top down. This is something that, of course, historians are very jealous of and something very annoying about because we are always told by anthropologists that don't just look at the state, look at the people. right? But we are also very appreciative of that kind of humanity uh, that we need to pay attention to the people on the ground, not just in the structure and the bureaucracy and the institutions and the lectures. The third component I want to highlight is the versatility, uh, meaning that the subject matter that Professor Seal has covered in her study, ranging from the land people, the boat dwelling people, um, to some of the mobility of the old people, and um, to a particular commune, a commune in, in South China in the 1980s and 1970s. So, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Hans. Um, thank you very much um, and good evening. Um, whenever I stand behind a podium, um, not that I'm afraid of you're not hearing me, but whether you could see me, <laughs> being, being such a 90 pounder, you know, I'm just not uh, very visible here. Um, but, um, but at first, no, well, thank you, Leo, for such a kind introduction. Uh, now it reviews my age too. <laughs> People can count the years. Um, and also a very big thank you for the Watt family for making this lecture possible. Um, so since this lecture is a series on Hong Kong studies, so let me begin with Hong Kong um, and I'll end with Hong Kong as well. I'll speak for about 20 minutes um, on some of, the, of my observations on Hong Kong, which I will repeat tomorrow in Cantonese. It will be a real challenge because over the years of being an ac academic in the US, you know, I've been at Yale for 36 years, and um, I've always talked in English. So speaking publicly in Cantonese really will show my shortcomings, but um, since this is a very, Vancouver is amazingly Cantonese come, you know, city, you know, I'm just really impressed. Um, so I will take up the challenge tomorrow and talk a lot more on Hong Kong and the area in Cantonese, but today I'll speak in English. Um, so um, just a couple months ago, I was in Hong Kong and I gave a public forum together with, you know, pop star, a writer, and then uh, um, a secretary for finance. Uh, that was in Hong Kong um, in a public forum. And my topic at the time was 
how big is local Hong Kong? You know, Buntou or Ben, you know, Bantu. And it's uh, it's a little tongue in cheek, um, because if we define Hong Kong either broadly or narrowly, then you get a very different batch of Hong Kongers, Hong Kong landscape, Hong Kong affairs, Hong Kong ideas, and Hong Kong imaginaries. So it all depends how you define Hong Kong. To me, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong local, is very, very big. From day one, I think Hong Kong, as a trans, you know, existed as a very translocal phenomenon associated with southern China, or what we call historically the Ningnan region, Linglam, Manfa. Mm. And, you know, with the Ningnan region, it's an ever expanding Pearl River Delta uh, on its north. And uh, it's, the delta itself was formed by a confluence of three rather large rivers, one of the largest river systems in southern China. And fisher folks uh, would moor along um, uh, uh, its Hong Kong's numerous bays and inlets. And on very limited floodplains and valleys in Hong Kong, villages grow into very powerful lineages. I mean, if you, if you count the lineage genealogies in Hong Kong, Feng Ping San uh, Tushuguan and Feng Ping San uh, uh, Tosukun, uh, there's already 350 of them, uh, compiled genealogies. Um, and yet, very interestingly, each of these genealogies um, would trace uh, the, the, the lineage's origin all the way to the central plains um, in, uh, in the Yellow River uh, 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 system. Um, um, one wonders why, you know, that these lineage charters were very much, you know, translocal from day one. Um, and we think that David Ford and I, you know, a colleague of mine um, who used to be at Oxford and then now in Hong Kong, uh, we claim, you know, we feel that to claim the rights uh, to settle in this southern Chinese area over the centuries, uh, local populations, these are very indigenous populations, they deemed it necessary to construct a myth of origin linking their ancestry all the way to the cradle of civilization up north in the Zhongyuan, Zhongyu, you know, Central Plains. These, these efforts, I mean, these are real indigenous southern populations. Um, that's why you know, I always wonder, who are the Cantonese anyway? You know, it, it, that question got me into trouble a few times with um, some of the parents of my Yale students, I have to say. Um, but anyway, you know, these efforts to claim ancestry up north, I think, were very instrumental means to acquire uh, very gainful statuses in an expanding agrarian empire ever since, you know, way back in the Han or, you know, probably, you know, particularly in the Ming and the Qing, the late imperial China. But since the 19th century, you know, coming back to Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong being a British colony and then a trading port um, at the margins of two very vast empires, the British Empire and also the Chinese Empire. Um, so Hong Kong provided a rather unexpected space for generations of immigration, immigrants and emigrants from very different parts of the world uh, to pursue fortunes or to take refuge. Some stayed and others left, but they all deposited values from their places of origin, and they also took slices of the Hong Kong experiences back home. So over time, what we have seen, you know, as the making of this place we call Hong Kong, is a very multi-ethnic place with cultural diversity, um, and also with very rich institutional memories. So that's very much, you know, as I say, Hong Kong local from day one was translocal and still is. So to understand the present and, the, and to imagine the future of this city, uh, I think it's very important for us to appreciate how strategically 
you know, how, you know, to appreciate the layers of historical coincidences that constituted this place we call Hong Kong, and to know how strategically generations have used the resources of a very large maritime world um, to advance themselves. And this is very much the theme of my talk today. Long Ying Toy, a very famous, uh, Long Ying Tai, you know, a very famous writer uh, who loves Hong Kong, I have to say. Um, she's in Taiwan, but she's uh, a lover of Hong Kong culture. Once commented on the choice of the tree, Bohemia, Ji Ging, Bohemia, um, as the city's flower. And she said it's very ironic. You know, Bohemia is a hybrid plant uh, which cannot propagate itself by itself. Um, it has to go with, you know, I don't know, cuttings and, you know, in Cantonese we call it bok ji, you know, it is, um, it has jip ji, right, jip ji. So it cannot propagate by itself, but it can be so luxuri luxuriously beautiful, the flowers. So that's uh, her characterization of Hong Kong, because, you know, Hong Kong was very much like a bohemia. So let's continue on to talk about this maritime world that has given Hong Kong its, a, a large part of its character. So first we have to look at Ningnan region. Ningnan region, very much the Pearl River Delta, south of the, of, of the hills, separating uh, Guangdong from the rest of China up north. Um, and Hong Kong has traced its cultural inheritance you know, uh, from this Ningnan region. But this region, for centuries, has already been very worldly, very worldly. Uh, unlike the grounded, isolated, and almost timeless yellow earth, often touted as the cradle of Chinese civilization in the Yellow River uh, system, this southern region has always been fluidly maritime. And Canton being the largest city um, in this region uh, since the Tang dynasty was very much a hub for China to engage with this maritime world, uh, with maritime trade. Uh, and then also the city was a hub for religious pilgrimages of all faiths, faiths, you know, from Buddhism to Christianity and so on and so forth. Um, and then also it's a window for the Chinese Empire at the time to collect and engage with tribute with these Southeast Asian uh, uh, um, other countries and then also uh, with diplomacy. So a lot of the diplomatic um, um, what do you call that, diplomatic, the emissaries going all the way to Africa would start from Canton by boat, cross Southeast Asia into the Indian Ocean and then to the Gulf. So Ningnan has always been a very worldly place and Kong, Hong Kong definitely drew its culture from, from that kind of a world. Uh, as I shall show in my PowerPoint later, um, such, such engagement left its footprints um, in the region. And so I would show uh, in Guangdong um, the, still the existing um, uh, mosque, which is called the Guangta, Guangta. That's the Huaixing Si. Huaixing Si, it's actually the oldest mosque in, 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 um, in southern China. Even Ibn Battuta, you know, 50 years after Marco Polo, and everybody knew about Marco Polo, but I don't think people know about this jurist from Tunisia, Ibn Battuta, who actually spent years and years in Asia traveling and ended up in Guangzhou and also in Hangzhou, and he visited this mosque. And so that was in the 15th century. And, um, and this mosque remains a thriving religious entity for Guangzhou's very large Muslim population today, including the Arabs and the African traders today. Another religious um, 
uh, landmark in Guangzhou is the Nan Hai Shen Miao, Lam Hoi San Miao. Uh, it was established even earlier. It was in the 6th century AD on Guangzhou's water edges. The major deity, of course, is Nan Hai Shen, which is the deity for commerce. commerce. Uh, but interestingly, among the pantheon of the gods uh, in the temple, you would see a very dark-skinned man with a thick beard, um, very likely a South Asian, uh, but dressed in a Chinese literati robe, but with this kind of a gesture, as if he's looking for a ship from afar to take him back home. And this deity, together with so many Chinese deities, were worshipped by little old ladies for 15 centuries. It's very much in the folklore. So even religion, you see very foreign elements being incorporated into the, the region's own cultural system. Then, you know, later, a few centuries later, the Western Sea Power came into the picture. Portuguese. Um, Macau, since the beginning uh, of the 16th century, was sim similarly a crossroad like Canton uh, between Europe, the Arabs, um, and South Asian worlds and coastal China. And in, on, in, in Macau, even today, you still see Catholic missionaries, uh, European-style merchant houses, Chinese temples, um, and multi-ethnic cemeteries. And they, they are very telling about you know, the history and the culture and society, a very creolized kind of social fabric uh, at the time. And the fascinating life and career of another person, which I will talk a little bit uh, later, is uh, Zheng Zhilong, Zheng Zhilong. People know about him? He's the father of Zheng Chenggu. You know, he was himself a sea lord who occupied Taiwan centuries ago to fight the Manchus at the time and the Qing troops. And, um, but interestingly, you know, he was raised in Macau, a Christian, um, and also he recruited 500 so-called black gods to be his bodyguards. Those were the freed African slaves who were brought to Macau, you know, from Africa all the way by the Arabs and by Salvations. So there it was, you know, that was the world in Macau at the time. Then later, of course, the British Empire came along in the 18th century on um, and it brought to this region not only Europeans or the Brits, instead it brought the entire British Empire. So there's a lot of ethnic populations um, from South Asia, uh, from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, an Indian writer, Amitav Ghosh. I'm sure people know about Amitav Ghosh. He wrote lots of books and he's written this trilogy on the Opium War, which is called the Ibis Trilogy. Um, the first one is um, uh, uh, sea of Poppies. Uh, the other is um, uh, Flood of... F river of Smoke. And the third, I think, is the Flood of Fire or something like that. But it was all three volumes that linked the ocean world of Mauritius, um, um, Calcutta, Bombay, uh, Canton, Macau, and of course Hong Kong from the 19th century on. Uh, in his trilogy, uh, the characters were the, you know, you know, Salibs and the Rajas and the traders and the compradors. And then, of course, there was also a very fascinating community of Indian Ocean sailors, multi-ethnic. They were Arabs, they were Africans, they were Malays, they were Chinese. And I always wonder, when these sailors were tra traveling with these merchant ships from the Gulf all the way to the coast of um, South China, when they have a storm, I wonder what the captain would be speaking. 
to communicate to its crew you know, to save the ship. I have no idea. Uh, Portuguese maybe, Arab, uh, maybe some Chinese, you know, it's up to the historians to find out for us. But the sailors are known as Laska. That's the term, Laska. Um, and uh, interesting enough, again, for somebody working on South China, um, um, these Laska were actually appeared in fishing our fisher folk ballads. Um, I don't know if people heard of Ham Seiko, Salt Water Ballads. That's songs, flirting songs, sung by the young men and the women on their boats. And I have to quote a couple very, very quick uh, sentences before I wrap up this um, in Cantonese. Because you know, I, cannot, I cannot sing it, but at least I can recite it in Cantonese. So a woman, you know, a young woman, will say to the, the, to the young man across the, the, the boat and said, um, Hong Kong yau gan yu yuk po. Hong Kong has a fish, fish meat, uh, whatever, um, uh, uh, shop. Um, so it's for my brother, you know, my, my, my lover brother, um, to have a hot pot, a you know, fish hot pot. And then the men would immediately answer and said, definitely were the red hair officers and taipans, the merchants, and saying that, look, you know, uh, you know, forget it, you know, young woman, you, you won't be able to reach any of these taipans. But, you know, the more lawsuits out, the laskers will be your lovers instead. So those were the sort of the folklore that was very much on the coastal region for these Chinese Dan fishermen um, and Laska. No, that's the term. Um, in the 19th century, um, we get even more uh, um, uh, foreign powers coming in. In Guangzhou, at the center of the city, uh, from the 18th century on actually, um, um, there were the 13 factories. We call the Sub Sam Hong, the 13 foreign factories trading with the Chinese compradors uh, for all sorts of trade, you know, uh, going between Europe and then North America and, and, and China. And in the middle of the foreign factory uh, area, now very much old commercial Guangdong, uh, Guangzhou, um, is a, a, one of the biggest, and actually the biggest cathedral today standing in China, which is called the Shi Shi uh, Sek um, And that's the Sacred Heart Cathedral built by French missionaries. And it was right there, uh, it still is, and it was one of the center of activities um, surrounding it, uh, not just religion, but markets. Markets that were selling um, goods from Manchester, um, tea and, 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 uh, from, and cotton from Bombay, tea from Assam, uh, precious stones uh, from the Middle East, um, and then also um, ivory and spice from Southeast Asia. So multi-ethnic uh, uh, trading communities. Um, of course, there were the pawn shops and also the native banks, uh, to the point that some commentators at the time, European commentators, were saying that this area was like Lombard Street in London. So that's the very, very, you know, uh, translocal, very historically global world. Um, and uh, there's again uh, um, a term that only we Cantonese would know. I bet people, how many of you here know Cantonese? Ah, so, have you heard of the, t the term Dai Yi Long? Uh, dai Yi Long, I don't know how to say it in, in, in Mandarin. Long, <laughs> I have no idea. Dai Yi Long literally means big earlobes. Big earlobes actually is usury. You know, people who were um, who were 
lending money in return from very lucrative, you know, uh, uh, loan sharks, exactly, loan sharks. But you loan, so I never understood what that means. And it probably had to do with some Middle Eastern traders with their earrings and all that. And then that became part of the Cantonese folklore that's intranslatable. So that just gives you a little bit of the colorful life of that region. And so uh, uh, one, uh, one last bit that's very important to make this picture complete are the Chinese themselves. You know, Hong Kong, uh, of course, you know, from very early on, were the destination for many, many kind of merchants from basically from Fujian and from Guangdong, big merchants. And in, in 1865, they set up the Donghua Hospital, which is a merchant charity um, registered uh, through the British Hospital Ordinance. Again, it gives you a kind of a hybrid feel. You know, without that British Hospital Ordinance, it would not have been there. And mind you, local customs at the time is that you don't die in hospitals. I mean, when you're seriously sick, you don't, there's no concept of a hospital. It was a very foreign idea. But they set up, these Chinese merchants set up the Donghua Hospital in 1865. Its board of directors were all the wealthiest Chinese merchants from Guangdong and Fujian, compradors for British and European trading houses. And they conducted elaborate rituals for charity and religion, and they took care of the laborers and other matters. And they negotiated the colonial encounter with the Brits. So in fact, they were the de facto uh, 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 leadership um, uh, dealing with uh, the colonial government for almost a hundred years. And so that's the Hong Kong's landscape, social landscape. And Hong Kong remained for a long time a very porous place. You know, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Elis uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sin, actually calculated that between 1880 to 1920s, 6.6 .6 million people passed Hong Kong you know, from China to overseas sites, and 7 plus million went, came through from overseas to China. So that was what Hong Kong was about. So people came and when they brought cultures, they, they took cultures away. So by the early 20th century, what you really see is a landscape, a soundscape, according to my colleague Maip, uh, Dr. Maple Ching, um, that it's a soundscape that Thai, uh, you know, which is, which has a shared linguistic um, um, character, which is what we call the West End dialect of Cantonese, Sai Guan Wa. I speak that Sai Guan Wa. So it's basically from the merchant community that grew up in Guangzhou, uh, uh, sort of west gate of Guangzhou. And it's a very sophisticated, upwardly mobile dialect, which now we, can, we um, sort of connect with uh, Cantonese. And that sophisticated uh, language became global through these trade routes and, and flow of people and goods that you know, uh, uh, Leo was mentioning. Um, and she associated that region as comprising of Sang, Gong, O. Sang meaning Guangzhou, not province. Sang, Gong, O. Dongyang, Langyang, two oceans. And San Gam San, Gao Gam San, basically Canton. Hong Kong, Macau, plus East China Sea and South China Sea, plus the old Gold Mountain, which is San Francisco, and then the new Gold Mountain, which is Australia. That whole thing, you know, of the Chinese diaspora, with the hubs, you know, Macau, Guangzhou earlier, and then 
Hong Kong that came afterwards, forming a core region of Cantonese culture, linguistics, art, performance, music, and so on and so forth. And so she called that the real Cantonese region. And so it's very, very big indeed, if you think about that kind of a linguistic and cultural area. And, you know, just one last example is the Cantonese opera. Cantonese opera, you know, they, they use, it uses violin, it uses piano, it has a lot of Western instruments. And it practiced cross-dressing, you know, gender, very cross-dressing uh, gender issues. And they have a term called zhao fao, meaning um, circul circuiting the ports. That is, these Cantonese opera troops will go overseas along a route, and that's exactly that route that uh, Dr. Ching mentioned. You know, the uh, first you originate from Guangzhou, and then Macau, Hong Kong, and then Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and then you know, um, San Francisco, um, and so on and so forth. You know, later, of course, um, I'm sure Vancouver, and and the Cantonese opera troops were followed very much by Cantal pop troops in the 18s and the 90s. So I'm sure some of the our, 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 our older friends here who have enjoyed uh, Cantal pop um, singing would have known some of these troops uh, uh, and the, the, these um, singers coming through. Um, so that is very much um, a cultural route as well. And so, so, for me then, to talk about Hong Kong local is therefore a very multi-layered phenomenon. Um, it's Canton, it's Ningnan, it's global. It's generations improvised it, reinvented it, extended it with brashly luxurious touch. And that has always been the Hong Kong I've experienced going up in the 50s and the 60s there. Um, so, is this maritime world, this multi-ethnic, this global world, the same as what China today uh, promotes as the one belt, one road, you know, sort of the one road, the maritime route? Uh, or is it similarly, in a smaller scale, the big, the greater Bay Area region, you know, the Taiwan Kui, Da Huan Chu, or the Yida Yilu? Is it the same? Um, I definitely would say no, because, you know, for the Ida Yilu uh, slogan and also the, you know, the, the Taiwan, you know, the, the greater Bay Area uh, region today as promoted by China, um, the concept, the idea behind the concept still speaks a language of the state, of the Chinese state almost similar to an imperial times of a civilizing process originating from a political center in China and then sort of disseminating its um, impact, economic, culture, politi political, you know, uh, abroad. On the contrary, my way of thinking about this route that I've sort of just mapped out, you know, in a very broad strokes. Um, to me, it's a much more interactive process over the centuries, bridging continental divides, and in which China was just one of the players. And in the three-volume set that uh, uh, Leo mentioned here, Asia Inside Out, that we, we did for Harvard University Press, um, entitled China inside out. We basically rethink what Asia is about. You know, a very important book also have inspired me way back uh, by two historians, uh, one geographer and historian. Is, the book is called The Myth of Continents. And it's by Karen Wiggum and her husband, um, Martin Lewis. And they challenged the land-based state-centered way of defining a country, an economy, a population, a culture, or whatever. But instead, they said, if you put ocean systems 
as the basis to define these things, you know, then it's a very different landmass altogether. And I thought about that. I said, wow, for the South China region that we're looking towards the world, if we mix, if we connect, you know, Brodel's Mediterranean, or Kian Choudhury's Indian Ocean, or Takeshi Hamasta's South China Sea, you add the three oceans and looking at the connections over the centuries, we have a completely different Asia altogether. And it's all the, you know, the way that we think about this big chunk in the middle between China and Africa today is that chunk that somehow it's not in the state language of China today, even though it talks about you know, one belt, one road. And actually, that warning was early. You know, I remember Professor Wang Gangwu uh, um, told, told us, you know, in a public talk a few years ago, he said, you know, China might have made a mistake of comparing itself constantly with the West. It's Zhong Sai, right? East, West. And then missing out the entire middle chunk of Asia and Eurasia. And therefore, this ignorance of things Asia, you know, Professor Wang claims, may invoke, you know, a very steep learning curve as China ventures out as a world power today. And I think, you know, for the rest of the time, I'm going to use a PowerPoint um, to, um, to illustrate this missing link of this large part of Asia, Eurasia that have been so important for the South China region and for Hong Kong, you know, as well. So let me just go very quickly into the PowerPoint. I can flip very fast. So, you know, uh, uh, Leo, just tell me when I have to stop. So this is very much South Asia. And I, I would say that it's a very global past, as I just mentioned. Uh, there's long distance trade. Um, there's a lot of historical links. It went way back. If you think about 200 BC, you know, uh, about 30 years ago, in the heart of Guangzhou City, they discovered a tomb of um, uh, way back. It's the grandson of the Nan Yue Huang. Uh, Nan Yue Wang was a general of Jiao, uh, a, a general in the Qin Han period, you know, 200 BC, who came south with his troops and turned native. And this is the, uh, the, the tomb of his grandson, the Nan Yue Wang. And what did they find? Um, motifs of a very maritime landscape, long boats, water, you know, headgears, and, and so on and so forth. But more interestingly, you also see silverware from the Middle East. Where, uh, there's about three in China today in the museums. This is one of them. How did it get to Guangzhou area, in, in the area called Panyu, Punyu? You know, that's where the site is. But of course, right now, it's in the middle of uh, 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 Guangzhou city. But there it is. But then, you know, we jump centuries, then we go to the, the Nan Hai Shen Liao. I talked about the, the god of the, the South Seas, the god of commerce. That was built in 594 AD. That's just when the Arabs and the South Asia, the South Asians, the Tamil South Asians were coming to the, this part of China. That's the temple, periodically renovated um, and given imperial titles. So this is the way that the imperial empire would try to control local society because when a god or a, de a deity of sorts became very popular, then the, 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 the local magistrates would immediate, immediately appeal to the higher-ups to give this god an imperial title. So it became part of the imperial system. Um, um, See, this is the guy I was thinking about. This is a, a new one. The older one that I had was, was a, a figure just like this. 
you know. And I bet he was one of those Tamil uh, um, or South Asian merchants who ended up stranded in Guangzhou, never got home, always waiting for a boat to take him home. And I remember, you know, little old ladies um, would call this temple Bo Lo Miu, Bo Lo Miao. And I said, why is it, you know, what, what does the temple have to do with pineapples? Right? Bolo is a pineapple. And then, you know, the, the old ladies would say, oh, of course, we used to have a bolo tree, you know, uh, um, in the temple. And I said, all you need is to go to Hawaii, you know. Pineapples don't grow on trees, right? And so I never figured it out. But a, t a friend, a, a, a South Asian historian, um, um, uh, told me once, he, he, he knows Tamil, you know, Southern uh, Indian language, and he said, Tam, uh, in, in the Tamil term, Bolo can actually, or is a very Buddhist, um, in fact, later, it's a very Buddhist term, to mean over the other shore. So how do you, we all put all these together? This is what we anthropologists have to do. But to explain why this dark-skinned, you know, a big beard person ended up being worshipped by Chinese old ladies for 15 centuries and feeling very comfortable uh, um, in there is something to be explored. But it does give you a very global touch of this region. And then, of course, we have the Guangta I mentioned before that was built in the Tang Dynasty. That's when the Arabs and the Muslims were coming in in huge numbers for trade. This is still there. That is the same um, uh, um, uh, 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 mosque that Ibn Battuta visited. Um, I was able to visit uh, the inside of the temple with my colleagues. This is a colleague of mine at Yale who's from uh, Iran and speaks Persian and Arabic and all that. So we were very welcome there. And the guy, you know, there's a lot of Arabs hanging around there. And they told us that, you know, this guy is from Lebanon, just from the way he dressed, and then the people from Pakistan and all that. But no African Muslims, only, um, you know, the Middle Eastern Muslims. So we were there. And of course, this mosque too was given a lot of imperial titles and so on and so forth. This is called the Huai Shang Si. And in the neighborhood, right in, in the center of Guangzhou, um, near the um, Zhongguo Dai Zhou Dim, um, it's one of the older uh, big um, uh, uh, hotel, modern hotels in the heart of Guangzhou. There, there was this Muslim cemeteries. This is definitely with very historical um, uh, uh, tombs dating back to about like 16th, 17th century. So, um, and so we visited that with the Imman, who's a young man from Beijing. So he showed us around and pointed to all the historical details. Um, and he was telling us that, well, among th there's 20 million Muslims in China. Um, not just in Xinjiang, but everywhere. Guangzhou is one of the biggest centers for, for the Chinese Muslims there. And so they need a mosque, and they, 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 they use all sorts of, of, of um, religious sites there. And this is the mosque inside the cemetery. Now again, this hybridity is fascinating. One look at it, David Four and I would immediately react and say, oh, this is a Chinese ancestral hall that really builds like that, but it's a mosque. And while we were there, they were building another one that again looks like a Chinese temple, but it's a mosque that would accommodate about 8,000 worshippers at a time, right inside the cemetery. 8,000, 8, yes, yes. So there's a huge population, in, in uh, Muslim population in Guangzhou. Um, and, uh, but of course, the Arabs and then the Africans, you know, at the height of, of, of the African traders' community you know, in the past 10 years, there's about 100,000 of them, from basically from West Africa uh, 
in um, they are Muslims and they are Christians, they are Anglophone and Francophone. So it's a lot of demand for the Muslim uh, uh, religious sites. But then let's talk about uh, historical maritime links. Um, and they, uh, definitely the, the Dao. Uh, I took this picture in a ferry in Zanzibar on my way to Tanzania. And then a week later, that ferry, you know, capsided and like about, you know, quite a few, 50 some people killed, including 12 foreigners. And my secretary in, 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 at jail was frantic because they thought we were in that ferry. We were in the early one. But there was, uh, the Dao was one of the major uh, um, transport um, between, um, I would say, between uh, South Asia and the Gulf. And so a lot of the Chinese junks would go from Canton all the way through Spik Malacca into the Indian Ocean. And then they would unload the, the, a lot of the goods there in South Asia, like areas um, you know, along the southeastern coast, uh, and then transferred into these Dao and then onto the Gulf area. Because the Gulf, um, the Gulf uh, waters are a little uh, shallow, so you need these rather than the big Chinese chunks. But then, you know, it's not, you know, what, what did the boat uh, uh, take? This is a giraffe that was given, um, it was collected uh, during uh, one of uh, Admiral Zhang He's um, seven trips to, to the Indian Ocean. And the giraffe was given to him by a Bengali king uh, and then, you know, um, and Zheng He's team took it back for the second emperor of the Ming, you know. So at the time, it was considered very auspicious, auspicious because this looks like a Chilean, because nobody knew what the, what the giraffe was. It was from Somalia, actually. So it went from Somalia to Bengal, and then through the Strait of Malacca, and then ended up in Guangzhou, and then, of course, later in Nanjing uh, for the emperor. So, but I don't know how the poor giraffe made it there, but <laughs> it did. You know, if it got seasick, too bad, but it survived. Um, so that was, you know, objects out of place. But if we think about connections with oceans, then these objects were naturally in place, in, in its own natural historical place. And then, of course, not only uh, uh, you're talking about the Arabs and the, and, and, and the Muslims, but then, you know, by the 16th century, of course, the Portuguese uh, dominated the ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean trade uh, with their increased sea power, you know, and um, the Dutch East India Company uh, uh, afterwards, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the Dutch and the Portuguese, the Spanish before, um, but the Portuguese set up base in Macau. That was a picture of early Macau. Uh, is it a Chinese place? You, you decide. Um, that's when Zhang Zilong grew up here as a Christian and recruited his 500 black gods when he, you know, uh, took over Taiwan uh, to resist uh, the Manchu troops in the, in the 17th uh, century. Now that's Zhang Zilong, a picture of Zhang Zilong and the black gods, you know, standing behind. These are fierce, loyal fighters and they were with him. Uh, all through. And then, of course, Hong Kong has its own pirates too. I mean, Zhang Zilong, of course, was known in history as you know, one major sea lord pirate, I mean, whatever you want to call him. But Hong Kong has its own pirates. You know, Bo Zai. Uh, this is a battle between the pirates in the, in the Hong Kong waters against the Qing troops before he surrendered. And so this is a picture I took in the, uh, in the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, one of the really worthwhile places to visit in Hong Kong, right next to the Star Ferry. Mm -hmm. 
It's very colorful, isn't it? But so all this trade, how did it affect the land area um, of the Pearl River Delta and of course Macau, Hong Kong and Guangzhou? Um, in the Pearl River Delta, that's also the time during the Ming and the Qing, you see huge lineage estates being formed by reclamation of the river marshes. And so these lineages were wealthy and they, they, they have vast areas of land and they built these ancestral halls. An ancestral hall usually has five layers and this is very prestigious because these walls are built with oyster shells that is hard and they're durable and they are cool in the summers. And so, but there are five layers and these ancestral walls were huge using wood beams from Onnam, you know, from uh, today's uh, northern Vietnam, you know, hard wood beams that's transported, you know, it takes, you know, 100,000 tails of silver to build one, you know, so that is the wealth that was accumulated. And of course, you also have big houses, and this one was told, you know, this one was in Xiaolan, in Zhongshan Xiulang, uh, Xiangshan County, uh, um, and it's still there, but the, the loop is very interesting because these indigenous people, having called themselves Han Chinese, they amassed huge wealth and they, they acquired all the symbolisms of prestige according to the imperial empire. So these were signs of your sons having acquired a, a literati degree. If you have that, then you can build you know, what Yi Ok we call them. I bet some of you who, who know the, the, the uh, lineage and landscapes in the Pearl River Delta would have seen a lot of these old houses. Um, and this one was, I was told that even the Taiping uh, troops have stationed there once. But foreign trade was still the big thing. So these lineages also operated big um, uh, 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 river landings for ships to, to land. And they're very huge. I mean, this can land ships that can, or big boats that can go between the Pearl River Delta, the Jiangmen area now uh, in Sanwui, all the way to Hong Kong and Singapore. So we are talking about the greater, greater uh, Bay Area now, but it's that stretch that the inset that the lineages were operating these maritime trade. So what do they use to trade? That's very exciting too. Um, silver dollars. Because with so many ethnic groups, what is the common denominator for equivalent you know, value? So these were the Mexican silver dollars minted you know, with silver from Mexico, some, but minted also in, um, in India, um, in Hong Kong, and some even in South Africa. And so, and th these four I, I found in, in a, a coin shop in Hong Kong. And I remember, you know, there's one, uh, let's see, this one is from, this is a, a, a Mexican silver dollar. This is minted in the US. This is Mexican silver dollar before, um, uh, uh, before it, uh, Mexico turned independent. So you still see the Spanish sovereign. This was minted in Japan. Now all of them would have to have a common value of silver content, which is about 76% of a silver tail of silver. And how would I guarantee that? I mean, it can be faked, right? So this is where the thing, this is very, very interesting. Now I, I went to the shop in Hong Kong and I said, give me the ugliest coins you can have. And the guy would say, look, you must be crazy lady. People really want these shiny, untouched, you know, silver coins and just know the ugliest. Because these are stamps, imprints by the Chinese native banks to guarantee 
that this coin has that kind of silver content. So they put their reputation on the line. And so that's how people trade. So the goods were brought from America to these factories and then you know, a lot of the goods from China will also be shipped back. This is the, a picture of the 13 foreign factories in Guangzhou before they were burnt down in 1822. These were the Chinese merchants, compradors, uh, that, um, appointed by the Qing dynasty to trade exclusively with particular countries. Uh, so if you go back to the, 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 the 13 factories, each of them have represented a foreign country, you know, the Dutch, the, the Brits, the Americans, and so on and so forth, the French. So this is one of the Sanbui this is a native son from a Lu family from Sanwui. So they traded tea. You see foreigners and Chinese and then people uh, packaging tea in Guangzhou. And then in the Peabody Museum in Boston, you find a lot of these Western goods all made in Guangzhou. So, you know, a historian would tell us uh, China has been world factory ever since the 18th century. I mean, it's not just today, I mean, you know, these, but of course, a lot of these goods were produced with a, with a Chinese touch. These are wallpapers and Western furniture. It's not used by Chinese, but they're, they're for a foreign market. Ceramics, the same way. These are not the tea sets you would imagine used by Chinese families. Beautiful porcelain. Um, and um, and again, ceramics commissioned by this one, by obviously an American client, a Portuguese client, by an Islamic client. I saw a f quite a few of these ceramics in Istanbul, in the royal palace. Um, so they went all the way. I mean, you know, that was... That's, you know, I always wonder whether the fellow, um, the Chinese, you know, craftsman, putting all those characters on the plate, whether he understood what he was writing. I don't know. I have no idea. But it does have a bit of a Chinese touch. And of course, ivory, you know, this is the uh, model of a flower boat. Now that gets to another issue here. The Pearl River at the time was full of activities, lots and lots of, you know, uh, um, not just trading and, and goods, but also prostitution. So a lot of the Dan fishermen women became courtesans of the song and, and the singing and dancing and, and, and entertaining of merchants. So they were all there. Um, that's what we call a fa tang, a flower boat. And of course, chinoiserie, uh, that's also um, uh, European clients for things Chinese. So 18th century. But then it's really beyond foreign trade. We're talking about how this kind of foreign trade affected the daily life of the little guys on the ground. This is a temple way back near the western edge of the Pearl River Delta in Sanwui, uh, a pilgrimage center since the Ming. That's the god. It's a Hong Sheng, you know, Hong Sheng. There's a river god. But interestingly enough, on the stone stele across the entire wall of the temple were uh, uh, different occasions of the temple's renovation. And who were the contributors? Basically, local and translocal merchants. But the, the denomination they use, these are Mexican silver dollars, not tails of silver. They are silver dollar, trading dollars. So, you know, it's one thing to have these silver dollars used for trade, but that's another to use these silver dollars for a temple contribution that really tells you how much 
uh, this area, maritime trade, has already penetrated daily life. That's again another example. This is an elaborate ancestral hall that's just recently rebuilt. Um, um, and, uh, but look at this. These are Dutch figurines. I didn't notice it until David Ford, we were having, having a, and then he said, hello, look at that. I said, what's that? Yeah, okay, so, but anyway, so that's again just things to think about, you know. Um, um, I'll just go through this very quickly now. I only have three more minutes, uh, five more minutes. So, um, merchants' quarters. So where do they live, these people? Multi-ethnic, uh, from different areas. Um, this is the 13 factories I mentioned, you know, with a certain architectural style. They were all burned down in 1822. That was the fire. But then Opium War started and then you got Hong Kong emerging. Uh, similar styles of architecture. Today, who can guess what, where this is? Zack K. That's heart of Pearl River Delta in Zhongshan County or, or municipality. This is Kaiping, of course, um, again from overseas Chinese, um, a rather Western hybrid. But look at this, also from, uh, 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 this is also from Kaiping. It has a very distinct Mughal style. But I, I bet the style were brought by overseas Chinese merchants in Southeast Asia who sort of got the kind of um, Islamic motifs in architecture and built their houses that way, right in front of some Chinese village houses. This is downtown Hong Kong historical, a similar style. This is Macau, similar. Where is this? Sarah. This is Mumbai, right behind Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, right behind the Taj Hotel, that was that suffered a terrorist attack. You know, th these are Parsi merchant mansions, Parsi merchants who were trading everywhere. They are they are supposedly one of those big earlobes. Um, so let let me flip very quickly to the modern era. You still see that kind of fluidity. This is um, the Emirate Towers in Dubai. These are the advertisements for China Southern Airline, daily flights to Lagos, to, to, to Dubai, you know, between Guangzhou and others. So it's very, very rapid and, and frequent. Um, um, in 2007, you, know, you see all sorts of foreigners being there in Dubai. Uh, after the financial crisis, only the Chinese were left. But they, were, they become very dominant in Dubai today. So these were the, these were the you know, constructions that was built very much by uh, North Africans, you know, South Asians, um, you know, um, Bangladeshians, um, but also a lot of Chinese engineers and technicians. Um, building these buildings in Dubai. Of course, they were sold to one Joe merchants, basically. They suffer huge losses during, during the financial crisis, I have to say. These are just advertisements to sell these things to the Chinese market. And then, of course, we have the Chinese, uh, uh, um, the Chinatown and the Chinese newspapers in Dubai. And then remittances. Um, again, um, you know, not just Western U uh, Union, but a lot of traditional chaopi, we call them, uh, it's very similar. And the, the people involved, these are the Chinese technicians waiting in, um, in the uh, uh, Dubai airport. And then again, another cultural fusion. It was in a women's university in Dubai, and they had a Japan night, and there they were. This, this natural fusion of culture, 
Um, so there they were in their kin kin kimonos and hijab and you know, there it is. Yeah, but this is beautiful, it's just sort of there. And then of course we went to uh, uh, Oman too, you know, na neighboring in these Gulf areas. And this is a, a, a Baluchi merchant who's been there for, sen for generations, he said, in Muscat. Muscat, selling Indian Ocean spices. But of course in the same bazaar, you see these Western style models, you know, with their sunglasses and styles, but selling goods, you know, textiles, actually basically made in India and China. I mean, these are naturally not objects out of place. They are very much in place today for that region. But that's what I mean, but the multi-layered fluidities and processes that made it the way it is. So I'm going to really skip. This is Guangzhou. I'm back to Guangzhou now, um, uh, accommodating tens of thousands of African traders. So you have to have a, 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 you know, these visa centers on the edge of the city. We call urban villages, you know, cheap places to rent and live. And they have you know, um, trading centers for these African traders. And they sell, of course, phones and electronics. They also sell wigs, produced in China. You know, the, the idea of beauty. You know, I didn't realize that Chinese wigs were so much a hot item in Africa. But of course, you also have this. All produced, all made in Dongguan and, and other uh, Pearl River Delta areas. Jeans, shoes. I don't know how the buyers will choose them, but there they are. <laughs> And what's surprising were these African cloths. They were also produced in China today. And I was just thinking about all the African traders, what they have lost in livelihoods. But it's massive today in China in, in prov providing for th this market. Higher end things, you know, uh, um, you know electronics, but also surfaces. In multiple languages, you can tell. I mean, they are catering to West Africans, Francophone, Anglophone, Muslims, and Christians, and all sorts of medical surfaces, that people come for that. This is the area, they, you know, in very, very bad terms. Um, and I, sometimes I find that the Chinese can be so racist, but there they are. You know, the taxi drivers call this area Chocolate City, which is not very nice. Uh, but uh, it, it, the, the kind of loaded racism is just in your face uh, when you go there. Um, there. There it is. You know, these are uh, very big wealthy merchants from West Africa, Nigeria, uh, uh, Ghana, um, Senegal, um, uh, Ivory Coast, and so on and so forth, with their Chinese Workmen. That's the street, you know. It's in Guangzhou, I mean, not in Africa. And beautiful co costumes. The women traders, too, they are, they are huge numbers. They are wealthy. And then, but they have a hard time trying to get taxis. Sometimes, you know, they would hire a young Chinese assistant and she would be flagging down the taxis and then these folks would jump into the taxi after the taxi stopped. So that's the way to, to deal with these uh, racism. And then increasingly, African restaurants. You know, I've gone to this one, but um, uh, with my Chinese uh, informants, uh, the Chinese villagers, they didn't seem to like it. But anyway, I thought that was an experience. And then people form families too. And religion, right? That is the Sacred Heart Cathedral that I mentioned earlier. Um, on every Sunday afternoon, there would be an English-speaking service by a Chinese priest, and the whole place was just filled with Africans. There they were with their families, and their cars, and their kids. So maybe I'm really running out of time, maybe I shouldn't go for this. Uh, Chinese in Africa, 
Zanzibar, I found a Qianlong period. Uh, you know, oh, this is Guangchai, this is Guangchai, this is typically Qianlong period color. And then, of course, these are the recent China Africa uh, relations, you know, medical services, Tansam Railroad, um, um, infrastructure, so to speak, stadiums that was very much done in the 70s uh, from this area. But the interesting thing is that it's still the southern provinces today that are relating to Africa, still that kind of a reach. Um, um, but I won't go very far now. But these are like experimental stu stations, Chinese roads, Sorry. Chinese land, marked miles and miles of land, you know, bought by Chinese companies, Chinese roads. And I've talked to some of the construction workers who are Chinese, and I said, when you clear these roads, you know, when you build these roads, you have to clear a lot of villages and settlements. How did that go? And he just looked at me, and a very sweet man, and he said, very sad. That's what you see. All along with this chai 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 chai, just erasure. And these were the villages who were displaced. I bet I shouldn't end up with Hong Kong, but there it is, that multicultural space, landscape of power, HSBC, Standard Charter, Anglican Church, St. John's Cathedral, and of course, Lee Ka Shing's flagship. <laughs> Multicultural names of roads. You know, this is bricolage. You definitely see it there. Still, Chinese temples, this is inside the Manmo Temple that I talked about, you know, the, the, next to the Donghua Hospital on Hollywood Road. But of course, Hong Kong remained an international finance center. There it is. Looking north, that's the Bank of China and the dominant economic power today. And then this is obviously, you know, reunification rituals for CCTV. But true to Chinese Hong Kong character, I call the, the next, the last picture, Marketing Mao on Cat Street. Cat Street actually is the name for, an, a proper name, Lasker Road, right across the street from the Manmo Temple. There it is. Mask, marketing Mao on Cat Street today. <laughs> so Hong Kong remains very entrep entrepreneurial. It, positioned itself well between China and the world, and uh, we'll see how long this space would continue. Uh, it's hard to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>